Have you ever wondered statistically what your chances of survival would be if you were bitten by a shark? There's over 500 different shark species in our oceans, which range in size from a few inches to over 20 meters long. So if you ended up somehow getting bitten by one of the smaller ones, it's unlikely that you're gonna die from that bite. One of the bigger ones, however, and well, that might be a different story. I imagine when you've seen or heard about fatal shark attacks before, the species responsible is almost certainly gonna be one of what we call the big three. That's bull sharks, tiger sharks, and white sharks. And it's these three species that make up the vast majority of incidents, both historically and in present day. So what would your chances be if one of those three sharks decided to bite you? Which one of those sharks do you think you're more likely to come out the other side of with your life still intact? Well, I'm gonna tell you in today's video, so stick around to find out which of those big three sharks you definitely don't wanna bump into on the wrong day. And I'll also tell you about some other factors which might either increase or decrease your chances of survival as well, which I think are pretty important. Anyway, welcome back to another Shark Bites episode, everyone. Just really quickly out of interest, I think it'd be quite cool at the start here to see which shark you guys think has the lowest survivability rate for human attacks. Like which of bull shark, tiger shark, or great white, if it bit you, you think you'd have the least chance of surviving that bite. Comment that below and then at the end of the video, come back and check your comments, see if you got it right or not. Now the stuff that we're gonna be talking about today is based in scientific research, data, and statistics. It's not just some random opinion piece by me. It's information from an awesome research paper that came out a few years back now and I've been meaning for ages to do a video on it. There's definitely a bit of a caveat that I have to mention at the start and that is that all of the data and the numbers that we're going to be looking at today are data from Australia. The reasons for that is because it's a country that is home to those three shark species that I just mentioned. It's relatively high globally for shark attacks and historically that data that they have goes back over 200 years. It does mean though that we can't exactly broadly apply this to the rest of the world. It'll be somewhat applicable but not statistically. That in itself would be quite a hard thing to do because you'd have to factor in so many different things that can play a role when it comes to shark attacks like shark species, shark personality, environmental conditions, socioeconomic factors, that list there could go on and on. This research that's been done here though is actually so important because it highlights the differences between the perceived threat of a shark bite and then the actual statistical real threat. There's probably millions and millions of people out there in the world and likely some of you watching this video right now that perceive the threat of a shark bite to be higher than it actually is. That's not your fault by the way, it's been conditioned into you by the media that you consume and often by the way these animals have been presented down the years. For a lot of people that is a very real fear and it's their reality that they live. And even though the likelihood of being bitten or killed by a shark is tiny, the effect on the people involved and their communities is absolutely massive. It's a really complex relationship that's been happening between humans and sharks for years and that doesn't look like it's gonna change anytime soon. The human population continues to grow and more people than ever before are heading into the water and because of that, you're going to get more shark bites. That's what the data shows anyway. Unprovoked shark bites have been steadily increasing now for the best part of the last 30 years according to the International shark attack file. And after America, Australia is undoubtedly the next highest shark attack hotspot. The Aussies have their own Australian shark incident database, ACID, which has records that date all the way back to 1791. And for the purpose of this video, we're just gonna be looking at those big three sharks. All three of them are distributed across Australia. And since 1791, there's been a combined 547 bites, 183 of which were fatal. That's about a 30% fatality rate, which is around double that of the global shark attack fatality rate, reminding us that Australia remains a pretty tricky place to stay alive. So we can see here on this handy map, all of those 547 shark bites that I just mentioned to you. Blue for bull sharks, green for tiger sharks, and orange for white sharks. The circles that you can see represent bites that were survived, and then the crosses are fatalities. Looking at the map then, you can see there's a clear north-south divide between the species, with tigers and bulls predominantly biting people on the north coast, and then white sharks on the south coast. And what you're looking at there is just a visual demonstration of the latitudinal temperature restraints for the respective species, with tigers and bulls preferring the more tropical waters up here, and then white sharks liking those slightly cooler temperate waters down here. We do get some crossover here along the east and west coast, especially this east coast here, which is just a mass cluster of bites and fatalities, which is fairly easily explained by the fact that approximately 80% of all Australians live on that particular coastline. More people equals more shark bites. That's probably your most basic stat of the day there, but now let's break it down by species. Let's go from most likely to survive up to least likely to survive, shall we? Coming in in third place then, the shark that you're most likely likely to survive a bite from is the white shark. Shock horror, who had white shark as their number one? In total from this data set, there were 270 white shark bites and of those 270, 67 of them were fatal. 25% fatality rate, or in other words, a 75% survival rate. Now that right there, I'd say at first glance, is a pretty surprising number. You might think that with the white shark being the largest predatory shark that we have on this list, your chances of surviving a bite from one of them would be quite low, right? But 75% is a really high survivability there. 
Now, the study that I'm referring to here doesn't actually speculate on the number differences between the species. So I'm going to have to do the speculating myself. And I do have a few different lines of thinking here. One of them is somewhat to do with behavior. White sharks, like lots of other shark species, are quite explorative in their environment. They'll test out loads of different things to see if they're an appropriate food item. Unfortunately for us, though, a white shark testing out a human can cause some serious damage. But more often than not, when this shark bites a person, it'll swim off. Now that's either the shark realizing that the thing it's just bitten isn't a prey item, or it's the bite and spit technique, where it's waiting for that thing to bleed out before coming back to finish it off. I think if you read up on the number of occasions where people have been bitten by a white shark and they were in the water for several minutes before being rescued, but the shark never came back for a second go, then you'd lean to it being that first reason. Also, I'm saying more often than not here, so that doesn't mean there aren't occasions where the sharks don't flee the scene. I'm pretty sure every time I mention white sharks occasionally biting people, without fail, I will get someone in the comments mentioning the Simon Nellis incident. They're likely people who haven't listened to my thoughts on that particular incident, which you can do so there, by the way, but isolated examples like that of Simon Nellis, horrific and tragic as they are, are not representative of all other incidents. They're outliers. 75% of the time, people will survive white shark bites. I think if I was playing devil's advocate here as well, we could say, well, maybe the majority of these white shark bites on people down the years have been from juveniles who are even more explorative with their bites. Juveniles are of course smaller and less likely to do as much damage as a larger individual. So that right there is probably more survivable. The study itself doesn't differentiate the bites here between adults and juveniles, likely because they don't have the data available to analyze. Right, okay, coming in then at number two on this list of most likely to survive, we've got the bull shark. In total, there were 157 bull shark bites, 60 of which were fatal, so a 38% fatality rate or a 62% survivability rate. I was kind of surprised to see bull sharks coming in here at number two. Before reading the study, I had them at number three. Looking at some of the specific numbers, location was a massive predictor for bull shark bites with 86% of them occurring in freshwater or estuarine habitats, which does support the notion that these areas are really important for bull sharks at various different life stages, namely the first few years of their lives and then also when it's time to mate and give birth. Hence why you'll often get some big adult males and females kicking around in estuaries and rivers. One of the most interesting things about bull shark bites from this study though shows that bull shark bite survivability has increased massively over the years. This graph here demonstrates that so clearly. Look at that curve there and all the data points at the bottom here. Basically, if you were bitten by a bull shark between the year 1900 and 1960, you were almost guaranteed to die. That is a wild statistic. And if you're looking at that graph wondering why the survivability of bull shark bites have gone up so much in those 100 years, the most likely reason is to do with the speed and the quality of medical aid available. Back in the early 1900s, the quality of on-scene medical resuscitation was pretty poor, as well as the ability to treat major blood hemorrhaging from limbs. And both of those things have taken place during or after a shark attack, i.e. the person's drowned during the process or they've lost a limb. But alongside that, you've also got so many more water users now who are nearby when things like this happen. And they can provide assistance by calling the emergency services or doing impromptu treatment. Back in the 1900s, some of these Aussies were likely heading out for a swim in the Brisbane River on a Wednesday morning completely on their own and there wasn't a soul to be seen for miles. And if they ended up being bitten by a bull shark in that river, there's literally no one there to help them. So their chances back then were slim to none. There are a few things though that might have helped them back then and definitely do help people today in terms of surviving. But first, we've got to talk about our number one on this list. So the shark that you're least likely to survive a bite from is of course the tiger shark. In total, there was 120 tiger shark bites, 56 of which were fatal, which is a 47% fatality rate or a 53% survivability rate. Almost 50-50, the toss of a coin. Personally, I had this shark as number one on my list. Let me know in the comments if you guys did as well, and we don't really have to guess why. These sharks are awesome predators. They're one of the most opportunistic and least fussy sharks when it comes to food. They'll eat basically anything. Pair this with the fact that they can reach some whacking great sizes and have a jaw that looks like this. I'm honestly not surprised they're top of this list. Another thing I think we've got to consider here as well, if I bring back the bite map that we had a look at earlier, you can see that historically the majority of the tiger shark bites, the green ones, are here on the northern section of Australia's coastline. That right there is a wild stretch of coastline. The vast majority of it is just pure wilderness. So again, your medical services right there are going to struggle to get to you pretty quickly. Okay, so right at the start of this video, I mentioned to you that there were a few other things that might increase or decrease your chances of surviving a bite from one of these sharks. And one of those things is the location of the bite on the body. Pretty unsurprisingly, legs are the most common area that are bitten when it comes to shark attacks. It's likely to do with behavioral strategies for the sharks who most often will come in from underneath or from the side and that just happens to be where our legs are. But it could also be to do with how we as humans might be using our legs as a defensive strategy by kicking at something to try and get it to go away. I mean, if you're kicking at the mouth of a shark, let's face it, your legs are gonna get injured. And the problem with all of these leg injuries is our femoral artery. This particular artery is one of the most important blood 
blood vessels in our body, carrying blood from the abdomen to the lower sections of your body. Even if it's just nicked slightly, you're gonna bleed out within two to five minutes. And we've got two of them, one in each leg, which means that if a shark has bitten our legs and damaged this artery, your survivability rate is way lower. You're much more likely to survive if you've been bitten on your arm or your midriff than you are your legs, statistically speaking anyway. Now, I can hear you grumbling away at your screen saying, well, there's not much I can do about where a shark chooses to bite me, and you said there'd be things that I could do, and yes, I did. And so there's one really big thing that can help you survive in situations like this, and that's a watercraft or flotation device. When people in the water have something like a surfboard or a bodyboard or even a kayak, that's something that can massively increase your survival chances. Looking at the numbers here, when people had one of those flotation devices, the chances of surviving a bite from a white shark went from 45% to 88%, basically doubled. And then for a tiger shark, their survivability went from 30% to 92% tripled because whatever that device is, it's giving you two benefits here. The first is that you can use that device to put between you and the shark itself and all that serious damage is done to the device rather than you. There are so many cases where you can see the severe damage that's been done to a surfboard, but the surfer themselves has barely come away with a scratch or has really minor injuries. And then the second thing it's useful for is like the name suggests, a flotation device. If you've been bitten by a shark, your ability to swim properly has likely been impaired and your chances of drowning go up considerably. But if you can use that surfboard or kayak or inflatable boy, whatever it is, to stay afloat, you're not going to drown and your chances of surviving go up. That's why we tend to see more fatalities when it comes to swimmers, snorkelers and scuba divers than we do with surfers, bodyboarders and kayakers. I think one of the craziest kayak videos that I've seen recently though has to be that transparent kayak one. A few weeks back I reacted to that particular kayak video. It's about as wild as you can imagine and you can check out my reaction in this video here. Honestly, watching some of the behavioral signals coming from that white shark as the video goes on is insane. So it's definitely worth a watch. 